<laughs> so thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I am hugely excited, Clarissa, to be a part of the launch of your book. Um, I went to college with you, but didn't know you. And so I got to know you as a fully born preeminent war correspondent. And so it's a real treat to kind of go back to the origins in the beginning and figure out who the person on the other side of the screen really is. And just to get started, um, I think we need to acknowledge that it is midnight where you are. Yes. Um, and if that's not hardcore enough, you, you just finished doing a live stand up on CNN. So thank you for being awake. <laughs> I'm used to it. I know you are. Um, so just to begin, I think the perpetual question that I have, I think everyone has for a war correspondent, somebody who risks their life to tell stories in conflict zones is what animates that and where does it come from? And as I said, I went to college with you, but I don't really know that story at all. And it's something I've always wanted to ask you. So where does this all start for you? I mean, I think, you know, growing up, I was always really into traveling and storytelling and um, I was privileged to have uh, exposure to a lot of different countries growing up, but actually it was my senior year at Yale. And um, as you well remember, 9-11 happened and mm -hmm. it was like, as for so many Americans, this sort of thunderbolt from the sky. And for me, this real awakening and a sense that I had not been adequately or sufficiently connected to what was going on in the world or understanding um, different currents in the world. And I became completely addicted to the news where before mm. I had been reasonably well informed, but certainly not uh, and what I would call a news junkie. And I was particularly drawn immediately. I just knew, and I can't explain why I knew that specifically I wanted to go to the farthest corners of the world where this hatred for America was percolating. I wanted to understand it better. I wanted to understand better how America was seen. I wanted to try to bridge this chasm, if you will, this mutual miscommunication, misunderstanding, dehumanization that I felt had contributed to this horrendous act of terrorism. And obviously, you know, I was, 22 years old. So I had like, or 21 years old, even I had all sorts of big ideas. And then, you know, after that, you eat a lot of humble pie and you realize that, that it's, it's a very different journey that you're actually on than the one you thought you were. But that absolutely was the moment for me mm -hmm. where I realized I had a calling and it does keep coming back to that in different cycles, this feeling of like wanting to bridge gaps, of acting as a communicator, of trying to get to places that other people can't get to and witness things. Okay, so you mentioned humble pie. So let's let's go there. I mean, how did you make your entry into this mm -hmm. kind of, I think, hardest of all journalism worlds to crack, which is broadcast yeah. television? You have an animating force in your life, which is 9-11 and a quest to understand it. But as best I can tell, you don't have a lifelong passion for or uh, history in television. So how did you actually make your entry into this industry? Well, I really started out at the lowest rung on the totem pole there is, um, which is <laughs> I did an internship with CNN in Moscow, which was a, a great experience. But then I couldn't get a job at CNN in New York because they were, mm. basically didn't have a, a slot. And... I went on a whim to an interview at Fox News and literally the next day, David Rhodes, who would end up being my boss at CBS News many years right. later, um, offered me a job on the spot. He was like, you're gonna be on the overnight assignment desk and I'm gonna pay you $25,000 a year. And I was like, yes, that sounds awesome. So I was on the overnight assignment desk at the Fox News channel, as I said. And what, are, what are those hours? Uh, you go in at midnight, you finish at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. And the highlight of the evening is when the delivery boy brings cheese fries. It was really demoralizing because mm -hmm. you finish college. And I hope there are people maybe listening to this who are wanting to become journalists or in college. And you're basically told all the time the world's your oyster. And then you graduate and you realize, wow, first of all, I have a lot to learn. And secondly, no one is really interested in the world being my oyster right now. They want me to go and fetch whatever it is they need fetching or do whatever it is they need doing. 
And that was a struggle. But my lifeline was that Baghdad was waking up in the morning. And this is just after the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I was on the overnight. So I was the one communicating with them. And I would be, I was just intoxicated by these conversations I was having with them and, and what their life was like there. And of course, you have a tendency to glamorize it because you've never experienced war except in movies. So it is a little abstract and it can seem glamorous. But that was when I just had this insatiable, okay, I know I'm going to get to this place. And I just kept telling my boss every day, I want to go to Baghdad, I want to go to Baghdad, I want to go to Baghdad. And finally, he was like, I can't be in a room with you anymore. So I'm sending you to Baghdad. <laughs> and what happened in Baghdad? Was that ultimately your kind of break, your big break? Yeah, it was. They, uh, I was producing, which is the best way to learn your craft as a journalist. And you get to work with some really talented correspondents. You get to see how they operate in the field. You get to learn about the technology, which is such a huge part now of what we do and news gathering and vetting information and all that stuff. And then eventually I told them I really wanted to have a go at doing on camera work. And, um, Again, I nagged and nagged and nagged and nagged and nagged. And it's awful being that person, but really, you, you just don't <laughs> have to. Um, and eventually they said, you can do it. You can go to Baghdad for six weeks. You can go for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. Um, which is which, when every other journalist wants to go home. Yeah, exactly. And of course, I was like, yes, I'm going to spend the holidays in Baghdad. Um, but shortly after Christmas, Saddam Hussein was executed. And mm. it was a huge story and none of the networks were really prepared for it because even though it was a long time in coming, it wasn't expected at that precise moment. And I spent 36 hours in a live shot position and wow. it was a real baptism by fire moment. And I think, you know, after that, you realize you're either like never doing that again and you're completely traumatized by it or you're like, okay, this is it. And I fell into the mm. latter category. I want to talk about the moment when the camera goes on and you're standing in front of it in those first couple of days, because you write in your book very compellingly about this kind of dizzy, yeah. very out of body experience that occurs when you realize that millions of people are watching you and your body yes. is, your mind are basically shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. You literally shut down and all you can hear in your head, it's like silence. And then there's a little voice in there being like, dude, you need to talk right now. Like, it doesn't matter what you something. say, but you've got to say something. And what you do, because the first few times it happens, you just go blank and you kind of go, uh, 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 and it's incredibly uncomfortable for everybody watching. Um, and then you learn by it because you're from it because you're so traumatized. But the, you learn tactics. And so one of my tactics that I do to this day, because sometimes when you're running on fumes, you haven't slept in three days, is I dig my nails into my palms. And I'll like, do it like just like to, it's, it's kind of like a shot of adrenaline almost. And, mm -hmm. and it just immediately kind of, and also you learn the art of just, as long as there are words coming out of my mouth, even if they don't really have any depth to them, it's okay. <laughs> the only rule in television is do not stop talking. That is <laughs> television death. Until they cut you off. Yeah. Um, I can't resist asking you about your time at Fox News, because you have been one of the rare correspondents uh, that I can think of who has pretty much worked at every major television network in the United yeah. States. And uh, and I, I have to think that one of the most intriguing, given its place in our culture and our politics now, uh, was Fox. And so give me a little bit of a sense of your of your experience there. Well, you know, here's what I would say about Fox. There's a lot of good people working at Fox. And when I was working at Fox, there were a lot of really good journalists working there too. And the people in the field for the most part, um, and certainly the people in Baghdad and overseas, they're just doing their job. They're going out, they're reporting on what's happening. And so much of the spin at Fox comes from the talking heads and the anchors. That said, um, it very quickly became clear to me that Fox was not going to be somewhere um, that w probably I would have a long career at, partly because I think I was sort of an anomaly. Um, I, you know, I know that they were sort of flummoxed by the fact that I wear my hair up and so I would get nice notes from anchors being like, Roger really likes it when girls wear their hair down. So please, we wear your mm. hair down. And, I and what would you write back some... to that? Sorry? And what would you write back to such a note? 
I was like, thank you so much for the advice. And then I actually, you know, being young and impressionable and desperate to please, I actually did wear my hair down once. And my mother called me immediately and was like, good Lord, that is not a good look for you. Like, <laughs> she actually said I look like SpongeBob SquarePants, but that's another story. And, and I just realized, you know, they weren't into what I was into and, and, and I certainly wasn't into what they were into. So mm -hmm. I'm always going to be grateful to the people at Fox news. One of them, I think Jonathan Hunt may or may not be listening right now who were very good to me and very gracious and, and played a mentoring role early in my career. But um, yeah, it's not, I think the, I would have become very frustrated very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in reading your book, it becomes clear that, a lot of countries capture your imagination as a television correspondent doing work overseas, but that a single country captures your heart and that is Syria. Yeah. And I, I wonder why that happened and how it happened. Yeah, it's such a good question because it wasn't expected. I knew when the Arab Spring, I was living in China when the Arab Spring started in Beijing for ABC News and I was feeling very much uh, FOMO, as as it's called, um, because I'd spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I'd lived in Beirut. I had spent some time studying Arabic. I loved the people, the places. But when it started to spread to Syria, which was a time, a place that I had spent a lot of time in going back and forth from Beirut to visit, because it's just a three hour drive from Beirut to Damascus, I mm -hmm. knew I needed to be there. And I spent months and months working out how to get there because it really was impossible at the time. And, and, and I did manage to get there. And honestly, Michael, just from the get go, this was a story that grabbed my heart. The people, the hopes, the dreams, the risks, the bravery, the sacrifice, the generosity of spirit, the fact that everyone who I stayed with, who worked with me was risking their lives to do that. And, and really, when you really think about what that means, would you ever, could, would any of us ever be brave enough to mm. risk our lives, to host a journalist, to get our story out there in the world? And, and the enormity of the sacrifice and risk that were taken really in the belief that something good would come of it, that there would be some form of, of intervention from the international community which regardless of whether you believe that the US should have intervened or not, one can certainly agree that there was something of a moral hazard uh, set by the Libyan example that led people to believe in places like Syria, that there was going to be help, that there was going to be intervention and that the world wasn't going to sit by while half a million people were, were massacred. Tell me what and you mean by moral hazard. I just mean that well, in Libya, there was direct uh, intervention, right? And a no-fly zone was established and Gaddafi was soon ousted. And when you heard the president of the United States saying Bashar al-Assad must go, people who were marching into a mm -hmm. hail of bullets to go out and demonstrate believed that that meant something. And that, you know, in the great words of, I think it was Lyndon Johnson, who said, if you tell a man to go to hell, be damn sure you can make him go there, right? Because if you tell a man to go to hell and then you don't do anything to make him go there and then he's not actually going there, it increasingly becomes A, an awkward situation for you because your moral authority mm -hmm. is suddenly being challenged. But B, much more pressingly and compellingly for me, uh, it becomes a sort of crisis of, you know, a humanitarian crisis of, of honestly proportions, John, uh, Michael, that I had really never ever seen before the level of killing the, the manner of killing the brutality of it the targeting of schools of hospitals it just it just breaks your heart and so the united states never really comes to the aid of those who are trying to take out assad and i think that's what that's what you're getting at and and so in some ways we're left with journalism in syria right we're yeah. left with a rebellion against assad who is uh, demonstrating some of the most extraordinarily brutal tactics ever used by a leader against his own people. And it is a few people, including you, who are there trying to tell that story. And I get the sense that it was incredibly difficult to even find places to go to tell that story. So how did you even begin to do that? 
Well, I think one of the real differences with Syria and other conflicts that I've covered is the idea that normally you go to the front line during the day, you shoot your material, you do your interviews, and then you go back to your hotel, which is a right. little bit far back from the front line. And usually there's other journalists there. And and you have this sense of detachment slightly. You have a space where you can kind of take a breath. In Syria, you didn't have that. I mean, we were crawling across borders from Turkey into Syria in the middle of the night, crawling mm -hmm. through mud and being hosted in people's homes. And when those people were getting killed, we were we were there. We were we were sleeping in their in their in their rooms with them. We were having breakfast with them in the morning. And so you're consumed by their grief and you are vicariously living through their experience of this conflict. And the effects of that, I think, are twofold. On the one hand, it imbues your work with this intensity and, and power and potency that you rarely, really get, even when you're covering something as dramatic as conflict. On the other hand, it becomes all-consuming in ways that can get a little confusing as a journalist because you want so desperately to help these people, to affect change, to in some way put an end to their misery and to honor the incredible sacrifice that they've made in aid of their own cause, but also just to protect you. Hmm. I want to help people who are watching this understand, without romanticizing it, just how dangerous this work was. And my sense it was extremely dangerous wherever you went, because you could not just be killed, of course, that's like an ever-present danger, but that anywhere you go where you're in contact with a Syrian rebel means that that Syrian rebel by association may be in trouble. And so yeah. I wonder if there's a moment that kind of highlights this kind of just inherent riskiness in the reporting you were doing in, in Syria. Well, I mean, you know, to put it one way, Every single trip I did into Syria, and I think it's now like there were 14 of them or something. Wow. Every single trip, Michael, somebody who I spent time with was either killed, kidnapped, disappeared. And that's not because they were working with me, right? That's because they're activists or they're rebel fighters. And, and sure, it doesn't help to be working with journalists like me. But I have never covered a conflict like that before where every single trip and i'm not even just talking about syrians i'm talking about people like austin tice um i'm talking about people like jim foley i'm talking about so many friends pete Cassick, um who 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 were journalists or aid workers who have also been lost and that is ex honestly it's excruciating and um, it's something that has taken me a really long time frankly to kind of unpack and make peace with. And yes, there are these sort of crazy dramatic moments along the way as well. And I remember being caught in a gun battle uh, in an orchard and the rebels retreated and we were on the wrong side of the front line. And my producer and I were sort of running through this orchard and I kept tripping over my abaya and my body armor was so heavy and it was raining wow. and the mud was all churned up and finally get to the end of this orchard and this rebel just threw me on his motorcycle and drove me to safety. Um, and in the moment, you don't have time to process all of that. You don't have time to unpack all of that. You're just living moment to moment and, and trying to get through it. And, and it's only when you go home, I think, that you realize, hmm, okay, I am becoming so consumed by this. I am losing myself in this a little bit because I now feel this intense sense of, of obligation to constantly be going back to Syria and to be having more of a positive impact somehow on, on the fate of people who are there. When you say losing yourself, I wonder what you mean. Do you start to feel like your life beyond that reporting is not really your life anymore? Yeah. And you feel this sense of detachment. I, I've always found it frustrating when you watch movies and stuff, not all of them, but a lot of them about war. People go to war and they see a terrible thing and they see a child dead and 
and they cry and they go home and they feel sad. And for me, it was never like that. I would go and I would see a dead child and I would not really feel anything. And then I would go home and I would feel nothing. And I would be around people I loved, my husband, my parents, my friends, and I would still feel nothing. And I would feel kind of irritable and just a sense of lethargy and lack of lack of feeling animated or joyful or inspired by anything in my normal life. And what I came or have come to realize over time is that if you want to do this job and you want to sustain it, um, there has to be a little bit more separation there. You have to invest in your normal life because that is your life. And there's so much guilt that comes with having joy when you've just left a place where there is no joy. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you, you must learn to make peace with that and to continue to, to find that joy. Otherwise it's not sustainable. I know that mental health is a bit of a taboo subject for foreign correspondents. The idea that the trauma that you have experienced or you experience, you know, kind of by association that that, actually damages you, which of course over time it does. And in your book, you're very refreshing in your candor about how traumatic these experiences were and how they started to be a little bit, not debilitating, but but something that you had to deal with. Yeah. And I have to be honest with you, that was petrifying to write that and to put it out there. And I gave it the book to my colleague, Arwa Damon, who does much braver work than I do. And the first thing she said was like, wow, I can't believe like you really went there and you were so honest because the reality is that even though we're all aware of it, it's like the elephant in the room, war correspondents do not talk about this stuff. They just, maybe when they've had like 20 tequilas, they're like, yeah, felt a bit ropey after that lost trip. But like, basically there is still a taboo around it. And I feel very strongly that there is no way you do this work for over a decade and emerge completely unscathed. Now that doesn't mean you're necessarily suffering from severe post-traumatic stress disorder, but what it does mean is that there needs to be awareness about what you're doing, what you're getting into, and there needs to be kind of preemptive self-care. You need to be kind of looking down the road. Okay, I feel okay now, but why don't I start talking to someone or writing about this or thinking about this in advance so that mm -hmm. I'm kind of on top of it? Because what happens to so many journalists, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then it's like, oh, wait, mm -hmm. I have a serious substance abuse problem and my family is falling apart and I can't sleep. I wonder why. Right. So what was the solution for you? The solution right. for me was um, therapy. Um, and I worked with a really great therapist here in the UK called Mark Brain, who used to be a journalist mm -hmm. and works with a lot of journalists and just does a lot of work on kind of reliving situations that were traumatic, but also finding out why it is that you're kind of hardwired to do this work and what it is that is breaking your heart about this work at the same time. And it gives you a lot of practical ways of kind of making peace um, with a lot of stuff. And I, I say that, you know, I'm incredibly privileged um, in so many ways and I have so much support from my family and friends and, and I have a wonderful family. So I really, I really can't complain, but I can't stress enough that like, Everybody who does this job should be in therapy. Frankly, hmm. everybody, should, everybody be therapy. should be in therapy. Everybody should be in therapy. Everyone should Definitely be in therapy. Definitely if you do this job. So wait, did you did you did you crack the code? Did you answer the ultimate question? Why uh, why is Clarissa Ward hardwired for this work? To circle back to the beginning. Well, funnily enough. Turns out, all I'm going to say on that is like, <laughs> you start out by talking about war and then you end up talking about your mother, like Always. endlessly. And it's about <laughs> my mother it has kind of a, a scenery stealing role in, in the book. Um, so th I think it look, a lot of it goes back to childhood and, and all of that. But we can't give away everything. We can't give away yeah, everything. Yeah, exactly. But fundamentally, what keeps me doing it really 
is that like, what else could I do? I mean, where else, what other job affords you the privilege of having a front row seat on history mm -hmm. and witnessing these incredible moments? And yes, you see the worst of humanity, but you also see the best of humanity. Right. And and that, I, I can't imagine giving that up. I can't imagine not having that space to travel and connect with people and find shared experience, even though we have nothing in common on, on many levels, that's what animates me and telling their stories and, mm -hmm. and giving them a voice when I can in this news cycle. That's, that's yeah. the juice. How much did you ever feel like you could quantify and maybe that's not even the right word, the, the impact of your journalism in a place like Syria. I'm thinking about a moment where I remember you interviewing Hillary Clinton mm. and saying to her, in a, in a way that perhaps only somebody who had been on the ground could say, given the credibility you had, you know, asking her about a bunch of questions about the vacuum that was opening in Syria when she was Secretary of State. And, and to me, if you read between the lines, the, the question you were asking was, don't you see how fucked up this is about to get? Yeah. Uh, and don't you feel some responsibility for it? Yeah. And, I, and I, I remember her giving you, as you know, Secretary of State probably would to a CNN reporter, a, a somewhat pat answer. But did you feel in moments like that when perhaps you were ultimately just kind of showing people the ineffectualness of, of American policy or when you were inside one of these rooms with one of these Syrian leaders, no one else had ever talked to before and it was on 60 Minutes, you know, a week later. Did you, could you ever say to yourself, I know that this change something i wish i could and the reality is um i could not and I, I i tell you why i mean there's two things first of all it's like so insanely frustrating you know i'm like cassandra there, like wailing prophecies from my tower and pulling out my hair and everyone's like she's crazy not that people were saying i was crazy or other journalists doing similar work were crazy but People didn't want to hear it in that moment for a number of reasons. A lot of them made a lot of sense. Some of them made less sense. And 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 what you have to come to terms with, what I had to come to terms with in Syria is my job as a journalist is not to make the world a better place. My job as a journalist is not to solve the Syrian civil war. Mm. I found peace when I was able to understand my role in much more humble terms. My like job is to go to this place and bear witness and not look away, even when it's painful, even when it's unbearable, to continue to bear witness, to continue to tell the stories, to keep banging that drum and to get the word out and shine a light on it. That's all I can do. I mm. can't change policy. And, you know, even I was fortunate enough to be invited to the United uh, Nations Security Council to, uh, to address them about Aleppo. And man, it was really cathartic just to sort of let it all hang out and be like, boy, have you all failed these people? Mm -hmm. And me too. We've all failed them. But you, you have to make peace with the fact that that may be cathartic for you and maybe some other people found some catharsis in listening to those words, but it doesn't change the fact that there are huge forces in the world that I cannot control, that I don't think we can necessarily control as journalists. And it's easier to do this job if you have a slightly, not cynical, not jaded, but just a slightly more humble approach to what your, what your role and responsibility is. Right, because it liberates you to truly just bear witness in the purest yeah. possible way. And without, I suppose, what might be the burden of, of, of trying to ch change the policy or change people's minds. You're just yeah. there to implement. Which is also, you know, then you're stepping into activism and, and we see a lot of that in journalism today. And that can be powerful and compelling viewing in its own right as well. But at the end of the day, it's, it becomes very, very challenging and mm -hmm. I would say problematic for a number of reasons. So we're gonna turn to questions in, in just a few moments, but I wanna ask about kind of this moment in your life. And, and the reason I wanna know what it's been like to be you in this moment is because I was very struck by a passage in your book about um, your kind of allergy to not 
to being ho- to being stuck in a domestic environment when you yes. really want to be reporting and you go shopping for a stroller with your husband and it's, oh. it seems like a form of torture for you to have to pick out a stroller in a department mm-hmm. store. Uh, and of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There are lockdowns and the whole, you know, the whole world is is not anyone's oyster. Uh, we're all kind of locked into our into our houses. So, how are you handling that? Are you crawling out of your skin? Are you determined to I mean, to kind of? I was out? for for most of lockdown. I was in my third trimester, and so I was kind of on lockdown anyway. Um, mm-hmm. I think I learned some lessons from my. Uh, first pregnancy with my son where I was like determined to prove that nothing would ever change. And I was wading through the muddy waters between Bangladesh and Myanmar and traveling to Yemen to cover the civil war. And um, this time I was a little more like, okay, let's just also recognize the fact that, you know, you're pregnant and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. So I think that made it a lot more bearable for me. What I have struggled with, I think, journalistically, is trying to cover things from your living room. Mm -hmm. And that goes against everything that I've known and loved. And even when you're able to sort of get access to these stories, everyone's wearing masks, as they should be. This is a good Mm -hmm. thing. But when you're trying to humanize a story and to and to make people feel not just the sort of politics of it or the substance of the uh, decisions being taken by people in power, but to understand like the heartbreak of it, of all the death, of all the loss, uh, of the economic devastation, that's so hard to do for, with mm-hmm. Zoom and face masks. And, you know, it really requires a lot of creativity. I can't say I have cracked that code yet, but that to me is deeply frustrating. Today on on The Daily, uh, we all felt that something was different and it was because a, a colleague of ours had gone up to Rochester and talked to the family of this man who was who was uh, killed in police custody. And it took us a few minutes to realize what was so different about the episode. And it was, oh, right, field reporting, real yeah. human being talking yeah. and the urgency and the immediacy of that. And yeah, it's just, it's irreplaceable. It really is. And because at the end of the day, it's so easy to forget, particularly in this moment we're in, we're so consumed by these political divisions and it, and it feels like such a, it is a vital moment, but gosh, it's nice to have a human side to these, because these ultimately this is about people. And, and sometimes that gets a little bit lost in, in the coverage more broadly. And um, yeah, and it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. Mm-hmm. I want to turn to some of these questions that are coming from people watching us here. And a lot of them appear to be from people who are interested in understanding how to replicate as best they can a career like yours. And some of them are just about the experience of traveling to so many different cultures and figuring out how to immerse yourself in them so quickly. And here's a question I want to start with. Okay. It is, Clarissa, how do you adjust yourself every time you're in a new environment, a new culture, and cope with the sense of being a quote, third culture kid? How do you bridge these Mm. cultures? And I guess I would ask that in particular, given how often you end up in conservative Muslim cultures. Yeah, I mean, I really do like the full immersion thing. Um, That's why I love learning languages. Um, that's why I, you will often see me dressed in conservative Muslim cultures in very conservative clothing. Um, partly that's a security thing. And partly for me, I just find it's a gesture of respect and it opens a lot of doors when you can speak a few words of somebody's language, when you show that you're not wearing ripped jeans and you're willing Mm -hmm. to wear a headscarf and don't feel that that's demeaning in any way. Um, that really helps people lower their guards and and let them into your lives. I grew up in this kind of slightly, um, you know, unusual uh, upbringing when my mother is American and my father is British and we moved back and forth between the two countries. And so I had always had that sense of moving between cultures. Mm -hmm. And also as an only child, I think you're like always kind of desperate to fit in wherever you are. And so you become something of a chameleon. 
But I would just say more broadly for people who are interested in getting into this work and who are interested in how you immerse yourself in a culture, ask a lot of questions and like leave your judgments at the door. There will come a time when it makes sense to form uh, mm -hmm. opinions about these places that you've been. But when it, you're trying to learn about a place and trying to understand it, it's really good to do a lot of listening. And this is one of my big mantras in general, as a culture and society, I don't think we listen enough to people. And so yeah, keep your mind open and your ears open and, um, and you're bound to learn so much, it's thrilling. Mm. How do you wisely use social media is one of my favorite questions here because I don't <laughs> think, us, I think none of us have figured this out. I think we all know the perils of social yeah, media. I'm I'm sure it's, social media, honestly. Why is it that you use it as a tool in in finding people in your journalism? If yes, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. I actually, for me, it's been incredibly useful to find others, particularly during the sort of rise of ISIS and the Western jihadi, um, Twitter and Kick and all these social messaging apps. That's really how I was able to do that. And, and it's hugely helpful and it's a total game changer as well in terms of recruitment for any extremist group, right? Um, so I think it's a huge door opener. And in the beginning of the Syrian civil war, no journalist could get in and we were relying mm -hmm. on images being beamed out from people's cell phones. As a journalist, that's incredibly challenging to try to verify the information and work out the context in which it was shot. And we've all seen the perils of, of getting something wrong. Um, so I do think it's a double-edged sword, social media. And the only advice I always give people is don't retweet anything that doesn't come from a source that you're absolutely sure is rock solid. Mm -hmm. I want to just add to what you said, because um, I, I, I was so struck by it in your book, you found a Western you know, member of a jihad group, right? I think it was oh, yeah. from- I, I Oh found, yeah, I found a few. I found, a, a, I was chatting at one stage to a Dutch jihadi, a Danish jihadi, an Australian jihadi, uh, an American jihadi briefly. And um, yeah. Oh, and, and why? I mean, what do you get? What do you get from those back and forth? Because there may be people who hear that and think, why would a CNN correspondent be talking because to a jihad member? You know, here's the deal. Whenever you're talking about extremist groups like ISIS, okay, there's definitely a few psychopaths in there. Quite a few psychopaths who were like saw a video of a beheading and they were like, yeah, I want to go do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of people who are lost or feel detached, who are drawn in by many different factors. With ISIS, they went really hard on this idea of like defending the Ummah, the Muslim people and restoring our dignity and like take yourself out of the disgrace of the West and elevate yourself and do it for your brothers and gain a place in paradise. And I wanted to understand that better because it's too simplistic just to say, oh yeah, these guys are all murderous psychopathic thugs. Sure, some of them were, and the problem, of course, is that whatever reason leads them to go there, once they're there on the battlefield, they quickly do become uh, desensitized to violence and often extremely barbaric. But I was really fascinated in trying to explore the mindset of what leads people to join a group like ISIS and how they have been so successful in recruiting Westerners, which, you know, to most of us, it's just like, what? Like, how on earth would that ever happen? And I find it's very helpful to talk to people and listen to what they have to say rather than shouting insults mm -hmm. at them, which is, you know, the other way of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody in this session named Liz has a, has a really great question, having read your book, uh, I think, which is, was your gender in any way useful in reporting? Oh, yeah. in the Versus really, counterintuitive. Yeah, it's counterintuitive because everyone thinks, oh, with the pervasive misogyny and particularly in conservative cultures. But here's the deal. First of all, in a lot of these conservative cultures, you as a Western woman are considered like you're, you occupy this nebulous space between male and female. You're like an honorary man. And so I can sit with the men and talk with them. But I can also then go and sit with the women, which, by the way, 
you know, 50% of, you know, my colleagues can't do or my male mm-hmm. colleagues can't do it at all. So that is an incredible privilege because spending time with women is you learn all sorts of, of, of different perspectives on conflict, on what's going on in any given place. Also, as a woman, you're seen as less threatening when it comes to trying to sneak through checkpoints. I was able to wear, you know, cover my hair and, mm-hmm. and cover my face and, and travel undetected. So I have found being a woman has has opened a, a, a lot of access to me. Um, and I feel very privileged, particularly when it comes to being able to spend time with women and children and see the different dynamics at play there. That's That's been incredibly helpful to me. Have there been moments where being a woman in these environments has been a real challenge? Well, you know, there's always going to be moments like when the son of a brutal Middle Eastern dictator tries to stick his tongue down your throat, as happened to me with Saif Gaddafi. Um, you, you may need and, to explain that. Uh, yeah, well, cool. I, I met him at a dinner party in Russia. It was a dinner party for a small group of people. He did. We were eight people. He didn't pay attention to me at all at dinner, never looked at me, never addressed me, never didn't say a word to me. And then we all got in a car to go on to uh, a nightclub, and he just turned to me and said, baby, which also well, mm. is not, not a, uh, no. And then just really tried to uh, kiss me. And, you know, it's hard because on the one hand, like my way to deal with the situation, which is the way I think many of us have often had to deal with these situations is like deflect it with humor and graciously say, oh, no, no, let's not do that. That's not going to happen. And then it became more persistent and it was like, I'm a Western journalist. You're not being very smart right now. And then finally I, uh, I had to curse him out in Arabic. I called him Ibn Sharmuta, which basically means uh, son of a whore. And there was a kind of a tense moment where I was like, either I'm going to end up dead by the roadside or hmm. it's okay because we're actually in Russia. And, and then he like turned and like smart. He would thought it was like fabulous. And he was like, now I'm in love with you or some nonsense. I don't know. It was nonsense. The thing that struck me the most, and I've seen this so many times before when I've been in in similar situations, although never with Gaddafi's son, uh, it's just the arrogance. The Mm -hmm. arrogance that some people, it just would never occur to them that you wouldn't want to have their tongue in your mouth. And it would never occur to them to do that to a man. No, although I don't don't know. I'd, I'd be interested to do some more digging on that. I mean, but no, no, for the most part, it's like, and you know what really bugged me though, Michael, more than him trying to kiss me, and this is gonna sound so weird, it bugged me that he ignored me the whole way through that dinner. It bugged mm-hmm. me that he only addressed the men in the room. It bugged me that he dismissed me when I was the only one in that room who spoke some Arabic, who had spent time in the Middle East. That's actually what pisses me off almost more is being consistently underestimated or dismissed or patronized that you know and especially you'll find yourself in situations where you're like i really know more about this situation than anyone else in this room but i still feel a little bit like i'm sitting at the grown-up table and i'm like hey guys thanks for letting me be here Mm -hmm. but is that 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 must be changing now in broadcast tv especially i mean of course it's changing in the sense that like yes we're entering a more enlightened era where you know but you'd be surprised michael I would say sexism is still pervasive. I mean, and even look at broadcast TV, the way you look on television is still hugely important. And it's a lot more important for a woman than it is for a man. And how many women do you see on television regularly who are over the age of 50 years old compared to how many men you see who are over the Mm -hmm. the age of 50? So yes, we've come a long way, but we we got a ways to go. Mm -hmm. There are a number of of journalists to be here who want your advice on the best routes into mm. in the industry. And, and their feeling, if I'm reading these questions carefully, is that the points of entry have narrowed and that it's yeah. getting more and more difficult. That's, of course, true in newspaper journalism. So I wonder what you tell people about how to get in now. Yeah, I mean, it's really challenging. I came of age in a post 9-11 era. There was a war in Afghanistan, an occupation, a war in Iraq and an occupation. 
Um, so there was a lot of, uh, of work overseas covering conflict and there were not that many people who wanted to do it anymore because it was so dangerous and the stories kind of bled into one another and, and, and it was difficult and hot and miserable and Americans were getting bored of it. And I was able to kind of seize on that, on that opening. Nowadays, we don't have those, those wars in, in the same way or certainly not American involvement in them in the same way. And people have stopped caring so much about Afghanistan. So uh, it is challenging. I tell people that you find any way you can to get your foot in the door and then you just keep plugging away in any way you can. If you're brave enough, um, do what I did and, and, and pick up sticks and move somewhere. I moved to Beirut and just set myself up as a freelancer. If you find a beat that you feel strongly about where you feel that you can contribute to it, but I also mm -hmm. think, you know, not to sound alarmist, but I see what's happening in the U.S. right now, and it, it it's hugely concerning to me. Um, I see the dehumanizing rhetoric that's being used, the proliferation of weaponry, and I think it's not it's not impossible that you will see more civil unrest in the U.S. and 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 maybe that will be uh, the big I don't want to say war story because war is a big war, but like you don't necessarily need to go overseas to tell important mm -hmm. stories about conflict and violence. And I think we're seeing that more and more. Mm -hmm. There's a lighter question here, but I would like to know the answer to it, which is, let me just re read this from Rick because he has a compliment. First of all, you're amazing, Clarissa. Oh, thanks, Rick. Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> um, now for the questions, which languages are you fluent in? Okay. And which languages do you know, but hope that you never need to use again? Oh gosh, okay. Well, fluent is a strong word, but like at my, at, in my best moments along the way, because languages are like, you know, they're like silver, they get a little rusty and you need to polish it up. Um, <laughs> but my French and Italian are good, um, definitely. My Russian and Arabic are conversational, so I can get by and shoot the breeze and, and, and and, and, and have a nice chat with people. But if, if it comes to discussing something more substantive, then I start to sound like a precocious five-year-old. Um, and my Spanish, I understand. I can read a newspaper in Spanish and I can speak a bit from French and Italian and a little bit of studying in high school. Um, and what else is, oh, my Mandarin. Well, I lived in China for two years, so I have basic Mandarin. Wow. And really, I hadn't intended to learn Mandarin but you cannot survive. Well, you certainly couldn't when I lived there without Mandarin because no one spoke English. So if you ever wanted to leave your house or order a drink or get in a taxi, you needed to learn some Mandarin. And as for the second part of the question, there is no language that I um, would ever want to stop speaking or not. I have an absolute love obsession with languages. I wanna learn more of them. I want to get better at the ones I already know, particularly Russian and Arabic. They're both such beautiful, incredible languages. And sometimes I feel I do them a disservice by, um, you know, butchering them with my best efforts. But still, learning languages is like the greatest, the greatest thing there is. It's like mm -hmm. a passport to the world. I can't recommend it highly enough. But if you don't speak languages and you still want to be a journalist, don't sweat it. Tons of journalists don't speak languages. You'll have other things that you're super good at that I can't do. Was it your mother or or one of your producers who said to you at some point, Clarissa, pick an accent and stick with oh, it? Oh gosh, you know that was ABC News. Because here's the thing, I could do it right now. I'm half British, so I grew. There up, you go. Yeah, and so <laughs> it's like being bilingual but it's totally useless. So when I was younger, I used to just go back and forth between accents. And then it would be like, I would bump into an American person in London. I didn't really know how to talk to them. And, and, and then, a, yes, they were like, your accent is swinging so much. It's confusing people. And then the EP of the evening news asked me where in Canada I was from. And I was like, okay, okay we need to just rectify this situation. We need to just keep the accent consistent. And so that's what I have uh, attempted to do since. So I want to end at the beginning, in a sense, by asking you why it is that you wrote this book and for whom you wrote this book. So the book started out 
as I found out I was pregnant and I realized that I wanted to write a letter to my unborn son to give mm. him a sense of who I was beyond just being like his mom and but you know to give him a deeper sense of, of some of the things that I've experienced and seen and wanted to share with him and so I started writing it that way and I, I sent a few chapters to Binky Urban my agent and she was like um, there's a lot of cursing and a lot of violence in here. And it looks a little weird to be writing this to your baby son. And so I ended up kind of reframing it, but I, as I, as I sort of finished writing it, I realized what this really is, Michael, is a love letter to journalism. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's what it's about. It's, it's a sort of homage to the like the stories behind the stories and the people behind the stories and all these acts of kindness and cruelty and highs and lows and they never make it on the evening news but these really are the moments that shape how we understand and see the world and see different conflicts and mm -hmm. sharing that with a broader audience felt like a really nice way to honor all those people whose lives I've intersected with. And mm -hmm. um, I'm just really excited to share it with everyone. And I'm so grateful to you guys for, for, for tuning in. I'm so grateful to you, Michael, for taking the time. I know how busy you are. And Buy it. Read it. Strand. Thank you guys all so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. I've had so much fun. Thank you. I've been thrilled to do this. Thank you, Clarissa. <laughs> Thank you, Clarissa and Michael, so much. It was a fantastic conversation. And for anyone who hasn't gotten the book, I dropped the order link in the chat, and it's also at the bottom of your screen. So on that note, have a great night, and thank you for joining us and spending it with the strange. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.